Good morning and welcome to the EFSA webinar on application procedure for GMO. My name is uh, Goran Kumrich and I'm a communication officer in the front desk of the Workflows Planning Unit and I will be moderating the webinar today. We are today here with the eighth webinar of our webinar series organized in support to applicants. The aim of the webinar series is to help the applicants and other stakeholders to better understand the requirements of the transparency regulation, its processes and tools. Today, we are happy to welcome more than 170 registered participants and they represent food industry, laboratories, consultants, research organizations and national competent authorities from Europe and beyond. We can move to the next slide to introduce the agenda of today's webinar. Together with me, we have a team of EFSA colleagues. We have three presenters today. It is my pleasure to present you our Benedict Wagenende, head of FDP unit, Anastasia Livaniu, scientific officer, in the FDP unit and Simone Gabi, leader in the uh, Transparency and Confidentiality Team Legal Affairs Services. We also have several colleagues who are acting in their role of contributors and they are Stefano Capè, Sara De Berardis, Federico Morale, Pietro Pifanelli, Daphne Cagli, and Francesca Volpi. My colleagues will be helping us with the handling of questions that you may submit throughout the webinar today. A bit on the structure of the webinar, presenters will go through the various phases of the application procedure. Uh, you can submit your questions via the question and answer feature on the top navigation menu of your interface. Question and answer uh, contributors will address them either in written or live during the dedicated question and answer session. And this will be at uh, the last part of our webinar today. If we go to the next slide, please, uh, where we would see the objective of the webinar today. We aim to explain the arrangements, steps and tools of the application procedure for GMO food and feed applications implemented by EFSA following the entry into application of the transparency regulation. And we will have the opportunity to address questions encountered by you applicants since the entry into the application of the transparency regulation and the scope of the webinar therefore will be focused on the impact of the transparency regulation on the GM food and feed, both the new and renewable applications. Uh, just to mention at the beginning that some elements are out of the scope of today's webinar, so clarifications about aspects of the authorization process which have not been affected by the transparency regulation. This will stay out of the scope of today's webinar and also uh, the Directive 2001-18 EC on the deliberate release into the environment of the ge ge uh, genetically modified organisms. So if we move to the next slide, uh, just to introduce a bit of the webinar guide for attendees, um, let me provide short webinar guide, particularly for the uh, colleagues and uh, participants who are first time with us. So uh, you will be automatically connected to a listen only mode in the presentation window, you will see the presentation and the speaker delivering the presentation. On the right hand side, you have the Q&A box, which you can use to submit any question related to the topic of this webinar throughout the event. This webinar is also recorded and the webinar is in English and you may 
pose questions in English. Some questions will be answered in written and some others will be answered live by our speakers. Um, so if some questions still remain unanswered, you may resubmit those via our Ask a Question tool at the Connect EFSA platform. Uh, presentations and also the recording of the webinar will be made available at our website in a few days after the webinar. So now I give the floor to our first presenter, Head of Front Desk and Workforce Planning Unit, Benedikt Wagenende. Benedikt, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Goran. Good morning, everybody. My name is Benedikt Wagenende, indeed head of the Front Desk and Workforce Planning Unit, so unit that you might know better as uh, the follow-up of the previous App Desk or Application Desk unit that you might still be more familiar with from the past. So also welcome from my side uh, to this webinar. I'm delighted to guide you today together with my colleagues through the life cycle of a GMO application. So we will explore together the process on one hand and also the respective tools to be used for your application on the other hand. The next slide, please. So as a short introduction, before we start going in the, into the more practical steps of an application, you can see here on the screen the four pillars of the transparency regulation and how these were implemented throughout the process, throughout the life cycle of an application and the different steps of the process. Um, main scope of today is to focus on the novelties in the process, in the workflow, so a lot of things also stay the same, so we'll really try to focus on what is new for all of us. Um, so transparency regulation, as you are well aware, uh, is applicable since March 27 uh, last year, 2021. So applicable for all new dossiers and applications submitted on or after 27 March 2021. So almost one year now. So quickly, the four pillars. The first one is the transparency, quite obvious, with the better access to scientific studies uh, throughout the proactive dissemination of the dossier and all supporting evidence. The second pillar, more reliable independent studies. The third one, a better governance with a closer involvement of the member states contributing to EFSA's governance and also the scientific panels. And then the last one, the risk communication pillar, so a more effective risk communication. Um, so moving to the next slide, please. First, we will now focus on the process. Um, as you can see here, we have four main steps in the life cycle of an application, the mandate and dossier intake, the preliminary activities uh, to the risk assessment, the third one, the risk assessment itself, and the last one, the output publication and respective dissemination of the output and the supporting documents. Um, so the first, in, in orange, you can see the new steps. So what is black in the slide is steps uh, that do not change, whereas in orange, we flag what is new, um, steps that are new to the, to the process with the entry into force of the transparency regulation. So looking first at the mandate and the dossier intake, uh, you can see as first bullet the pre-intake act activities. So with the new requirement to notify all the studies in the to EFSA in the notification of study database and also the possibility to request pre-submission advice, PSA as we say. Then mandate and dossier received stays the same. Withdrawal of the dossier is possible throughout the life cycle of an application, so no change. Whereas then moving to the validity check, there we have a new element, uh, an additional step to check uh, the dossier against the notification of studies. We will come back to that in more detail later on in the, in the uh, presentation. Uh, followed by the publication upon validity of the non-confidential version of the dossier as received by the applicant, so it's the first uh, publication step, followed by the assessment of the confidentiality request on the valid or the admissible dossier. Once uh, the confidentiality assessment is finalized um, and the dossier is republished in line with the confidentiality assessment decision, uh, there is the public consultation, so also a new step. And in the case of GMO, we also have the targeted consultation with member states. So this for the mandate and dossier intake, so the first big part of um, the life cycle. 
Then we have some preliminary activities. So the second box on the screen, um, this is uh, specifically for EFSA. So I will move directly to the risk assessment phase. So once the dossier is declared valid and the first steps are over, we move to the risk assessment. There, of course, uh, the main step is the preparation of the, uh, the scientific output, the scientific opinion. There is still the possibility to request for additional information. So the, the well-known clock stop is still applicable. But what is new there is that also there, there might uh, there will be an assessment of the confidentiality request on submitted new information following a request for information. Then we have the, um, the finalization of the scientific output and an endorsement uh, adoption uh, by the scientific panel, so no changes there. Moving to the last phase, the output publication and dissemination there, uh, the only change is that um, more information is published. So coming back to the transparency principles. So besides the scientific output, also all the supporting evidence will be made publicly available. Uh, you can see the arrow on the bottom of the slide, the confidentiality. This is something going throughout the life cycle from the beginning until the final end of the, the life cycle um, that there might be indeed confidentiality assessment uh, prior to publication of the, the respective elements. So this uh, for the process. If we move to the next slide, we have a closer look to the new tools because of course, um, um, besides the, the process, new steps, uh, those are accompanied by new tools that we are using and that you will be using to submit your application and uh, through the life cycle of the application. So the first one is the Connect EFSA tool that will be used for the notification of studies. Uh, for the pre-submission advice, both uh, general pre-submission advice, renewal pre-submission pre advice, also for ask questions, so to get any uh, questions to, to EFSA. Also, the public access to document uh, is going through the Connect EFSA tool and the public consultation. Um, looking at the second tool, um, the e-submission, the food chain platform, the ESFC, uh, this will be used uh, by you as applicants to submit your dossier, to build and then submit your dossier uh, to EFSA. Will also be used for requesting uh, information throughout uh, the life cycle of the application. So there will be the possibility to update the dossier at that at those stages. And of course, you can follow up the life cycle, the different stages of the dossier uh, through the e-submission e uh, food chain platform, the ESFC. Secondly, um, Open EFSA. Uh, thirdly, sorry, Open EFSA. So our dissemination portal, where you can uh, follow the monitoring of the risk assessment flow for all uh, the public, all the ongoing assessments and closed assessments, and where you will find the proactive disclosure of the information. So it's uh, the dissemination portal. And then the fourth tool, Portalino, is used in particular cases uh, to submit confidentiality assessments for. Um, for dossiers that are not submitted through the ESFC, but my colleague uh, Simone Gabi will come back to that in more detail. So these four tools uh, have been designed and will be used through different steps of your application workflow. So moving to the next slide, please. So um, before the first step, before being able to submit an application, so the very first step is to register in the EFSA system, so the account creation. So the next slide, please. So as indicated in the practical arrangements on pre-submission phase and the public consultation, you can find the link at the bottom of the slide. In order to initiate any pre-submission activity, a potential applicant, a laboratory or a testing facility um, to which a study has been commissioned shall as a very first step register in Connect EFSA. Um, third parties like consultants supporting uh, applicants that are authorized to present one or more potential applicants or laboratories shall also register in Connect EFSA. So it's very important to take away that all actors need to register, need to have an account in order to do then the next steps in the process. So you see in this slide potential applicants, the laboratories, testing facilities represented by John, third parties like consultants presented by Martin and then the last one is the public. For the public there is no need uh, to register because you may act as an individual and there is no need to register but there will be also no dossier submission activities. So, so very first step is indeed the registration. So moving to the next slide please. Uh, so here you can see a screenshot for from the Connect EFSA portal um, where there is um, a clear button to register to the portal. 
Um, so the potential applicant starts the registration in this portal, in this Connect EFSA, and he must register as the in entity um, that he or she is uh, representing. So that might be the entity, the company, for instance. Um, and then the account name will be the entity, the company name. Uh, and after that, after this first step of registering um, the, um, the the entity, sorry, uh, then individuals being part of the company can register and link to the respective entity. So moving to the next slide, please. Um, so after the registration, um, there are some steps needed. So there is um, a security check done by EFSA um, before then the account is really activated. So this takes few days. So it's important that if you know already that you will submit an application in the future or you will need to request pre-submission advice, you need to um, notify studies, register your account on time so that this uh, that there is a timely validation and activation of your account and um, allowing you to then follow up with the next um, steps and in the process. So uh, please keep in mind that this is taking few days in order to validate your account. So once the account is validated, the applicant is ready to use the functionalities of this Connect EFSA portal. Moving to the next slide, please. Um, so based on the first experience we had uh, using this new tool, some small adaptations were made. Um, so here it's important an attention point on how to link the different organizations. Um, an applicant or a business operator who wish to assign or the coordination or the submission to a third party, a consultant, please remember that both need to be registered in the Connect EFSA. So both need to have an account. Um, after both are registered, the account is activated, um, then the business operator applicant can assign the third party to his or her dossier. And this will allow the third party, here represented in the slide by Martin, to notify studies on behalf of the potential applicant, uh, Sarah in this case, once this link has been created. So it's important that um, there is, I mean, that every, all the actors are registered and that the link between the actors is created before then uh, the next step a notification can happen. Um, moving to the next slide, please. So um, organizations might also, ha also have multiple roles. This was also a slight change that was made after a few months of using the tool. So it made it possible that the same person can have different roles. So one single person can act as a business operator, as a laboratory, as a third party. So again, what is important is um, that all actors need to register to create the account individually, and then there needs to be uh, setting up the link between the actors so that all respective actors can do the activities according to their role. So moving to the next slide, please. So after the account registration, so we are registered in the Connect EFSA, uh, we move to the pre-application ID, pre-submission advice notification of studies, um, and we start first with new applications because in the case of GMO, we have new applications and later on we will come to the renewal applications. So starting with the new application. Um, the next slide, please. So um, the first step, if you wish to initiate any pre-submission activities with EFSA, pre-submission activities, here I speak about the pre-submission advice request, but also notification of studies is considered as a pre-submission activity. So the first uh, action is to request a pre-application identity. Uh, the pre-application identity is composed of three elements. Um, so first, uh, the pre it's strictly related to the business operator or the potential applicant. To the su subject of the application, the subject of the application is the identification of the regulated product that is subject of the future application, so the name of the product, for instance. And then the third element uh, that is composing the pre-application identity is the intended area, so the regulated product area, as we say, of the future application. For example, in your case, that would be GMO, but of course it can also be pesticides or a feed additive. So these three elements form together the pre-application identity. Moving to the next slide, please. So how can an applicant, a business operator, a consultant request uh, general pre-submission uh, advice to EFSA? So there are three steps to be followed. So the first one is the organization to be registered. 
um, the pre-application ID to be requested, as we saw in the previous slide, and then um, the applicant can submit um, a, a request, can ask pre-submission advice uh, using the Connect EFSA tool. So you will see that then EFSA will provide the general pre-submission advice. Um, EFSA will store the pre-submission advice and the respective summary of the pre-submission advice. So at that time point, uh, it's just stored. It's not disseminated, but the moment um, the application is valid, the publication of the general of the summary of the pre-submission advice will be published uh, on the open EFSA. So this is how to request pre-submission advice. Uh, moving to the next slide, please. So notification of studies for new applications. So for the pre-intake, the activities besides the pre-submission advice, what we were just looking at, so the general pre-submission advice, there is also the new requirement, a new obligation on the notification of studies. So here, both actors, business operators and laboratories should notify uh, new studies to EFSA. Study notification, you see centrally in the slide, the study notification database. Uh, this is a strictly confidential database, only accessible to EFSA. So um, what are the steps? The applicant should notify their studies supporting their application. And all studies are inc included in the application should be notified in the database or any possible deviation should be justified. So meaning that um, at the pre-submission phase, uh, there is this obligation to, to first get the pre-application identity, as I mentioned before, in order, to, uh, in order to, to be able to initiate this activity. Then you have the um, including the potential, so there is a notification of the studies, and then the moment uh, the potential applicant uh, submits the dossier, EFSA will perform a validation of the application, including a check against the notification of studies database. Um, so this is on the notification of studies for a new application. Uh, moving to the next slide, please. So pre-application identity for new applications. So when requesting a new pre-application identity, um, the potential applicant must select the food domain. So as you can see in, in the screenshots here, so the food domain that would be in your case GMO. So there is a drop down list. Then uh, below the authorization type, what in your case would be the regulation, uh, the respective GM regulation, uh, and then the related application type. A related application type, there are three options. So there is the application for authorization of a new genetically modified food term or feed, what we are looking at now, so a new application. The application of modifi for modification of an existing authorization of a genetically modified food or and or feed, and thirdly uh, for the renewal of the authorization. So we will look at the renewal in a second. So there are three different uh, options according um, three different application types. So moving to the next slide, please. So so. In case it concerns a renewal application, uh, there are some additional steps required compared to what we're looking at for a new application. So uh, the first one is the possibility to request pre-submission advice, the general pre-submission advice. Um, this similarly as for new applications, general pre-submission advice can also be requested for renewal applications. And this can be requested at any time point before submission of the respective application. So here the steps are not different. We were looking at this for the new application and the steps are exactly the same. So keep in mind that also for renewal applications, there is a possibility to request general pre-submission ad advice to EFSA. So that's the first possibility. Moving to the next slide, please. Uh, the notification of studies for renewal application. So here it's uh, slightly different. So uh, as a first step uh, is that the potential applicants get the pre-application identity for the renewal. So getting the pre-application identity is similar to what we explained before. So this need to request this pre-application identity. Once uh, the pre-application identity is available, then the potential applicant submits the list of intended studies together with also the study design of the intended studies. And this is in line with Article 30. To C1. So these intended studies, they enter into the notification of study database, uh, and all this again tro goes through the Connect EFSA tool. As a second step uh, on the right hand part of the slide, EFSA is going to launch a public consultation on the list of the intended studies. 
and will provide the renewal pre-submission advice. So the aim of this public consultation is to inform the elaboration of the renewal pre-submission advice. And then as a last step um, is that the applicant, the potential applicant will notify the studies in line now with Article 32B. So similar to what we have seen before for new applications. So this is then the, the notification of the studies. So where, whereas first we had the notification of the intended studies, now we have the notification of the studies. Moving to the next slide, please. Um, so some highlights for renewal. So we, we were looking at a similar slide for the, the new applications, uh, for the pre-application ID for the renewal. Uh, there is again the same information needed as we were looking at for new application, whereas there's an additional element that when an applicant creates a pre-application ID for a renewal application, uh, the information, uh, there is an additional field to complete for formal, uh, the formal application ID. So as you can see here highlighted with the star, uh, this formal application ID will allow to link the renewal application to the EFSA question number of the application of the first or the new request of the past for the authorization of that specific product. So this is slightly different. The pre-application ID for renewal is slightly different. So there is an additional field compared to the new actives. Moving to the next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot of the previous slide, highlighting the fields to be completed. So similar to what we also have seen for the new applications, uh, the food domain GMO in your case, the authorization type, the respective regulation, and the related application type that in this case would be the, the last one in the drop down list, uh, the renewal of the authorization of a GM food or feed. Uh, moving to the next slide, please. Um, once you created the pre-application ID for your renewal application, uh, you have to complete all the required information for each intended study. So you can here see a snapshot. So the fields must be completed as otherwise it will not be possible to submit your intended study for renewal. So there is study title, there is study scope section, including several uh, information that needs to be completed, like study objective, the test item, the components. And then the study design that also should be completed containing the study guideline on one hand and also study the design description. So this, um, what you see on the screen, this completion needs to be repeated for each intended study. And once all the intended studies are completed, uh, you can submit the list of intended studies for your renewal application. Um, moving to the next slide, please. Um, so following the receipt of the list of intended studies for renewal, EFSA will perform an administrative check on the list of intended studies and will launch a public consultation, as I was also mentioning before. So a public consultation on the intended studies for renewal, including the on the proposed design of these intended studies. So the consultation is remaining open to third parties, to the public uh, for a period of three weeks. Then all the comments received um, and in the step three, uh, shall be made public by EFSA immediately upon closure of the public con uh, consultation. So the comments received will be published on our dissemination portal, the open EFSA, once the public consultation is closed. And then as a last step, um, the results of the public consultation is part of the summary of the renewal pre-submission advice and that um, the, re the summary of the renewal pre-submission advice will be published only once the application has been declared uh, valid. So this is the same as um, also for the general pre-submission advice where the summary is published upon validity of the application. So we have now seen uh, how to register in Connect EFSA, how to perform the pre-intake activities, so the notifying the studies in the notification of studies, the possibility to request general uh, and or renewal pre-submission advice. So now we come at the stage where the dossier is to be prepared in the e-submission tool, ESFC. So I now give the floor to Anastasia, who will guide you on the e-submission uh, platform. Anastasia, please. Thank you, Benedict. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anastasia Elvaniu, and today I will give you um, an introduction and an overview to the submission uh, system. Um, this platform has been available since uh, January 2018 for the preparation um, of the novel foods uh, applications. It is developed by uh, the European Commission, 
and uh, in light of the transparency regulation uh, changes and in order to facilitate compliance with certain transparency regulation uh, aspects like the notification of studies requirements or uh, the confidentiality assessment, but also the dissemination uh, needs. Uh, this FSCAP version 1 platform was extended to uh, version 2 and the uh, e-submission food chain platform uh, was born. Uh, it is meant to um, support all different regulated product uh, areas, excluding pesticides that they are required um, for these applications. Their Euclid system needs to be uh, used. And in the right hand side of this slide, you will be able to see all the different uh, application types and areas that um, uh, this ESFC, this e platform uh, should be used, of course, including the food and feed um, GMO uh, regulation area. That is the scope of today's uh, webinar, but also the, those for the uh, GMO directive can also be accommodated, but it's out of the scope of this webinar. Uh, this platform is meant to uh, serve as the single point of entry for uh, applicants to prepare, um, submit, but also follow up on uh, their applications, but also by the European Commission and um, Member States um, users to uh, perform certain uh, risk management uh, activities. Uh, at the bottom of uh, this uh, slide, you will be able to see some useful uh, links. Um, the one is the URL to the platform, but also uh, some video tutorials to guide you through the, um, uh, the different, um, to, to teach you how uh, to um, use the tool, but also the user guide. I will now take uh, control of uh, the screen just to uh, allow you to move to the um, uh, demo. So as soon as you click on the um, URL of the e-submission platform, you will land on uh, this page. So I hope you can now see my uh, screen. So you will land now in the page of uh, the EU login. Uh, the EU login uh, is a very simple registration of your uh, of your email. In the user guide of ESFC, you will be able to find detailed instructions on how you can get uh, one of those. Once you manage to um, authenticate yourself, then you will land on the uh, dashboard page. So the dashboard um, is where you will be able to track all applications that you are currently uh, managing. Um, the ones that they are in draft that you can, uh, especially at this early stage, it is very important to start familiarizing yourself with the system and uh, try to play with them. It is fine. You can always delete them. But also the ones that are uh, already in progress and here you can um, uh, filter um, for uh, the respective um, stage of the application or also for um, uh, the number of the dossier. At the left hand side, there is this very important button support. When you click on it, you will have access to the user guide. Um, the dedicated pages of the EFSA website where all the guidance documents can be found. Details on the transparency regulation changes. And last but not least, a, an email a link to the email where you can contact through which you can contact the um, European Commission support team in case you have any questions uh, while preparing your application, but also through, through, throughout the life cycle of your um, uh, dossier. At the top right hand side, there is this button create new uh, application. And through these steps that we will follow now, it is the way of the system to allow you to select uh, which type of application you're interested in and you wish to pre start preparing. So first I select the food domain. In our case, it is GMO. Then I need to select whether I'm interested on an application for uh, under the regulation, um, the GMO regulation or the GMO directive. I will select in this case uh, GMO regulation. And then I need to identify and to select if my application is a new authorization, a modification or a renewal. 
for the purpose of this webinar, we'll select a new application. The process and the, um, uh, the functionalities that you will see today are the same regardless of which um, application type you select. So it will be the same for renewals and so on. Uh, as a next step, I need to select the um, um, member state. And I start the process. This uh, activity will generate a template, what we also call a table of contents, that is in all cases, in all different domains, adjusted to the needs of uh, the respective um, regulation or uh, guidance document. Uh, the template uh, is split in uh, three macro sections, uh, administrative data, public summary and technical dossier. And now let's see uh, through uh, each one of them. Uh, in the administrative data section, of course, we require you to uh, identify uh, the applicant, define a contact person, the person that will be responsible for the dossier in case we have, um, uh, we need to address um, any missing information. Um, uh, EU representative in case the applicant is outside the EU. Uh, then you need to define the subject of uh, the request, select the scope of uh, your application, give information on existing authorizations outside the EU, possible data sharing agreements and the cover letter. Here I would like to draw your attention to these two symbols. Um, the asterisk indicates the fields and sections that they are mandatory, so you need to provide information uh, in order to proceed. And also this one to the right hand side, this uh, little question mark that when you click on it, it will give you some additional information, some contextual help on what uh, you are expected to do um, uh, in this specific section. Moving on to the summary, uh, to the public summary here, you just need to provide the public summary that is free from confidential and personal um, data. Uh, also, in this case, you can um, click for more uh, information. For example, here you can see that um, the length should be up to two pages. Uh, so don't forget to uh, hit on this button to, to get further info. Then in the technical uh, dossier, um, in this case, in the GMO area, of course, uh, this structure uh, follows the, um, the structure that is defined in the um, implementing regulation uh, 508 of uh, 2013. Um, here you will see that to um, dig into and uh, identify the different sections, you need to um, expand by clicking on the plus buttons and collapse and go back by clicking on the minus. You will notice that there are several uh, sections and um, uh, subsections. Uh, for each one of the sections, when you reach the level of the file upload, it is important to uh, know that in each uh, one of them, you will need to upload the um, uh, main text of the technical dossier, but also all relevant uh, supplementary information uh, required for um, each uh, section. Um, here, it is also important to note that uh, you are not uh, required to duplicate any information. So, uh, for example, if um, a report that you upload here is also necessary further down in your uh, application, you just need to upload only once the first time that this is required and then in the later section you only uh, refer to it. Um, what is also uh, important to mention here is that um, also the structure needs to be, uh, the structure needs to be respected. Uh, any deviation from the structure, for example, if you upload um, uh, one single document um, at the highest uh, level of this, um, of this structure, uh, it will not be accepted and this would uh, require um, a request for uh, corrections during the completeness check. Um, now I would like to focus on the aspects uh, of uh, this platform that will help you uh, comply with uh, certain transparency regulation requirements. Starting from the top of uh, this page, we have the section on uh, pre-application information. 
As uh, Benedict mentioned uh, earlier, if you have engaged with EFSA for uh, pre-application activities like requesting um, uh, pre-submission advice or notifying studies, you will have received a pre-application ID. These IDs, these uh, uh, identification numbers need to be provided here in this section. And of course, it is possible to uh, have more than one. So you give these numbers here. If not, you just move on. If there were studies that uh, were notified, but um, they were not provided in uh, support of your application, uh, in this uh, part here, you will need to identify and define which are these studies. So uh, you need to give the ID number of uh, these studies, but also give the reason and a justification on why these studies were not uh, provided. Um, let's go now to start uh, filling in our um, dossier. Uh, I will start uploading uh, my uh, documents. As soon as I upload um, a file, the system will require that I define uh, a document type. The document type is selected from uh, a predefined um, list. Uh, for example, here we have a technical dossier text, study report, charts, cover letter, other supporting documents. So you select the one that fits um, uh, the document you upload. So let's say in this case, it is my technical uh, dossier text. Then it is also possible that in the same question section, I also wish to upload um, a report, a study report. So I select my study. In this case, the document type should be study report. As I do that, and note that this happens only if the document type equals a uh, study report. In this case, you will get some additional um, uh, details. You need to fill in some additional uh, fields. So first and foremost, you need to comply with the notification of studies requirements. So when you identify a document as a study, uh, you need to define to to to, to give the uh, notification of studies uh, ID that was received when you notified the study. But if the study was not notified, you would need to give a justification uh, on why this uh, was the case. Also for studies, you might have some, uh, you, you have some additional information to, uh, to provide, like the study type, the title, uh, and so on. So these additional, um, uh, this additional data, this additional uh, information are only required if um, the document you upload is a study uh, report. Uh, it might be very uh, useful to perhaps also read the um, um, contextual help uh, here that also gives you the definition of a study, perhaps to support you in this regard. So let's say that now I have filled in um, the whole um, application. I have submitted all the documents, but now I wish to request um, confidentiality for some of them. To do so, I would have to go here at the right hand side and click on the three dot uh, menu. Select request confidentiality treatment. And um, as soon as I do that, the system will require uh, that I take two different actions that are both mandatory. The first one is to uh, select and upload the non confidential version of the file I have originally uploaded. The second one is to actually build my confidentiality request. To do that, I need to select from a list of predefined legal grounds. As these are defined in the respective uh, regulation. Give a justification on why uh, this uh, I, I request uh, why I submit this confidentiality request. Identify the part of the text that this request uh, is for but also uh, identify where exactly in, uh, um, in the document uh, this uh, text is. Uh, it is of course possible that for each file you can have, you may have more than one confidentiality request for different uh, reasons, but again you would need to follow the same uh, process and filling in the same items. 
So I have uh, now um, filled in all the administrative data information. I have uh, complied with the different um, notification of studies uh, requirements for each uh, one of the studies, but also at the higher um, level. I have uh, submitted my confidentiality requests. I'm ready to, um, to submit the dossier. To do that, I have to go at the top right hand side uh, here and click on submit button. When I do that, the system is running some validation checks. This is very important because the system, of course, is trying to um, ensure that you are um, submitting a dossier that is as complete as uh, possible. Uh, so you're advised to follow uh, all of them because otherwise you will not be able to submit. So just as an example, you see that the first one that I get here is no applicant is provided in the section applicants administrative data. And of course, we cannot proceed uh, with an application without the applicant. So uh, now let's say that you have uh, submitted this one. I will go back to the dashboard to identify to find the dossier that is already submitted just to show you how this uh, also looks like after the submission. So let's find um, a GM uh, dossier. So this is all a dossier that is already submitted. If you see here, um, this is um, an application that currently is under uh, suitability and completeness check uh, in EFSA. If I, uh, as soon as I uh, open, I land on the uh, overview page. This is a new page that appears um, um, in your uh, application when you, from the moment you submit. And here it's a timeline where you can track all different actions that are taken uh, um, uh, for your application from any side. Either the action was uh, taken by you or by um, an authority. So, for example, here you will be able to see when the application was uh, received, when the member state acknowledged the application, when it was forwarded to EFSA, uh, the question number that was assigned, but also when uh, EFSA was requesting additional information and so on and so forth. And with this uh, remark on um, the timeline, I would now like to go back to the presentation to give you uh, a few more um, uh, details on what happens to your dossier after um, uh, the submission uh, and during the dossier intake and the portal uh, updates. Uh, when uh, the member state uh, forwards the application to EFSA or the European Commission, if this was a renewal um, application, uh, EFSA has to assign a question number. So the question number is assigned. You receive this question number in the e-submission system. When we also receive the mandate, we will also link um, uh, this mandate to the question number. At this early stage, uh, some basic information also becomes available in the OpenEFSA portal. Uh, perhaps the um, image here is uh, small to uh, see, but you might have already uh, searched a bit in the new view of uh, this OpenEFSA portal. So at this very early stage, the information that becomes available is the question number. The subject of the application, as this was inserted in your uh, application in the subject field of um, ESFC, you will be able to also see the date that the application was received in um, EFSA. You will be able to see the dossier number, the mandate number, uh, the application type, but also the name of the applicant. At this early stage, only this information becomes available and not the, um, the dossier uh, is not available uh, yet. Then the completeness check uh, process uh, starts as part of this activity, of course, EFSA um, uh, now is also required to perform the notification of studies uh, check based on information that is uh, available in the notification of studies database, but also provided in your uh, application. Uh, as part of this check, we might come back to uh, the applicant to request missing information. Uh, this request will be received in the e-submission system and uh, you will be able to also reply through the same uh, platform and provide the additional uh, data. Um, at this uh, stage, when this cycle is uh, complete, 
and the dossier is complete, is considered complete, then EFSA will declare the application valid for uh, risk assessment. Uh, at this stage and only now, uh, uh, as a result of the transparency regulation requirements, EFSA has the obligation to publish the non-confidential valid version of the dossier. This will become available um, in the same page that we described uh, earlier, where the um, dossier number um, will become uh, an active link where when you click on it, um, you will be able to see the, um, the non-confidential version of your, uh, of your dossier. Uh, at this stage, also the pre-submission advice summary is um, published if this was uh, given. When the dossier is uh, valid, the risk assessment activities uh, may start, but also the assessment of the confidentiality request uh, request starts at the same um, stage. And now we'll give the floor to my colleague uh, Simone to give you uh, more details on the confidentiality assessment uh, in the context of uh, GMO applications. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Simone Gabbi. I'm a team leader for transparency and confidentiality within EFSA's Legal and Assurance Services Unit. Um, next slide, please. We have seen already how in practice uh, the uh, confidentiality request uh, may be submitted uh, within the ESFC platform and also in Portalino. And we will now consider how uh, these uh, transparency and um, confidentiality requirements are uh, actually applied in practice in the context of EFSA's assessment of these requests. As you may see from this slide, um, the transparency regulation and also the practical arrangements apply for what concerns uh, applications submitted under the GM uh, Food and Feed Regulation to uh, the uh, applications received uh, by EFSA uh, as of the 27th of March 2021. Uh, for those that were submitted before the date, um, the previously applicable uh, regulation and uh, legal framework applies. Next slide, please. The transparency regulation uh, brought about uh, some important uh, changes in terms of uh, proactive disclosure and confidentiality requirements, and we have already heard some, some key features. In particular, for what concerns proactive disclosure, Article 29 of the GM Food and Feed Regulation, which refers to Article 38 of the EFSA's uh, founding regulation, Regulation 178 of 2002, uh, prescribed that EFSA must make uh, proactively available all information data studies submitted to support an application dossiers, as well as other information identified by EFSA and used by EFSA as a basis uh, for the opinion. This uh, general uh, proactive disclosure requirement, uh, which also applies uh, this to be highlighted to all uh, documents that are submitted to support an application dossier, finds the only exception of uh, the elements that are claimed and granted confidential status under Articles 39 to 39E of Regulations 178 of 2002, which is referred to by our, again by Article 30 of the uh, Regulation A29 of 23. Oh, uh. This, uh, um, this is possible at the conditions set out in these provisions, as well as in the EFSA's practical arrangements concerning transparency and confidentiality. And we will now move on to see what are these conditions. Next slide, please. The, um, this, this, uh, ex this principle of proactive disclosure comes uh, also with the uh, with the principle that confidentiality is an exception to transparency and that and, and this is uh, to be highlighted the burden of proof for the submission of compliant and valid confidentiality requests lies exclusively on the applicants this also means that efsa is not in a position to take any proactive action in order to uh, satisfy a possible need of the applicant to keep uh, certain items confidential, unless 
these items have been successfully claimed confidential by the applicant itself. It is therefore extremely important that the applicants uh, get familiar with the uh, substantive and procedural requirements set out in the EFSA's practical arrangements concerning transparency and confidentiality, and also obviously with the presentations that we are providing today. In the meantime, while EFSA is uh, assessing uh, the confidentiality request submitted uh, by the applicants in accordance with these uh, practical arrangements, EFSA will not disclose the information initially claimed confidential by, by the applicant. Next slide, please. The procedural requirements to which I was uh, one click more, uh, actually a few click more, uh, in fact, um, the procedural requirements um, uh, to which uh, I was initially referring regard the uh, submission of the confidentiality request via the appropriate e-submission platform that we have seen already with, uh, in the presentation provided by Anastasia and uh, as well with the uh, submission of verifiable justifications as well as with the attachment of a confidential and non-confidential version of the document including information claimed confidential. Also, the um, confidentiality request initially submitted by the applicant may not, modified, uh, may not be modified later unless EFSA uh, six certain clarifications uh, with regard to the information already submitted in this regard. It is therefore extremely important that all the key elements and the appropriate verifiable justification and supporting documentation is shared by the applicant at the moment of the submission of the application dossier. Indeed, modifications of the submitted confidentiality requests are in principle not allowed unless again EFSA requests uh, these changes. And this assessment, the assessment of the confidentiality request, comes at no fee and no cost for the applicant. Next slide, please. One uh, key uh, procedural aspect is also linked to the fact that uh, successful confidentiality requests may be submitted only with regard to the items placed on the closed positive list, uh, part of the uh, provisions I made reference to above. For what concerns applications submitted in this particular uh, procedural context for gem food and feed, these uh, items, the items that may be uh, theoretically be claimed confidential by the applicant, relate to the manufacturing or production process, except uh, for information which is relevant for the assessment of, of safety, uh, to the commercial links between a producer or importer and the applicant, to commercial information revealing sourcing, market shares, or the business strategy of the applicant, as well as, for, and this concerns more specifically uh, these applications in this sector, DNA sequence information, except for sequences used for the purpose of detection, identification, and quantification of the transformation event, as well as finally for breeding patterns and strategies. Any other confidentiality request, that is confidentiality request submitted on items that are not part of these elements, uh, will fundamentally be rejected by EFSA. And EFSA has no discretion in this regard because uh, this uh, particular close positive list is set out in now in regulation uh, 1829 of, 20, of, of 2003. Next slide, please. It is also to be highlighted and underlined that um, according to EFSA's practical arrangements, the non-confidential version of the application shall not contain personal data. And the only exception in this regard concerns the name and address of the applicant, as well as the names of authors of published or publicly available studies supporting the application. These latter two categories must be disclosed. Other personal data have to be uh, boxed, claimed confidential, and uh, flagged uh, uh, as, as confidential in the confidential version of the, of the application dossier, and uh, blackened out in the uh, non-confidential version of the dossier that is meant for public disclosure. 
it is particularly important for uh, personal data, uh, including names and addresses of natural persons that are involved, who are involved in the testing on vertebrate animals or in obtaining toxicological information. Because in this case, Article 39E, Paragraph 2 of uh, Regulation 178 of 2002 specifies and prescribes that these personal data shall not be disclosed to the public. Next slide. Confidentiality requests have also to be uh, submitted, and we anticipated this partially, uh, with a verifiable justification. And this verifiable justification must include the clear information that um, the, uh, the, the clear identification of the information that is claimed confidential uh, with the indication of the pages, sectors, uh, sections of the document where the information is to be found, the identification of the appropriate legal basis or ground under which the information is claimed confidential. And this is done by, as we have seen, uh, identifying and clicking on the drop down menu in ESFC or in Portalino, as well as, and this is very important, explaining or confirming uh, certain elements and the reasons why uh, this, uh, this information, this information should be kept confidential. This must be done by confirming that the information is not in the public domain, because if it's publicly available, it cannot be uh, claimed confidential uh, successfully, as well as uh, must be confirmed that uh, the disclosure of the information claimed confidential would result in a potential harm to a significant degree. Um, insofar as the information has been acquired uh, in a legitimate manner and that it does not result in a uh, negligible harm, which is in fact a rebuttable presumption. Here the applicant is asked to confirm that the information is uh, resulting in a harm corresponding to at least 5% of uh, the annual turnover or annual earning uh, of the applicant itself, or uh, they are allowed to provide additional justification as to the reason why the disclosure of this information would anyway result in a potential harm to a significant degree, even though this uh, threshold is not met. And the applicant is also asked to confirm that the information claimed confidential is sufficiently novel. And this is also a rebuttable presumption requiring the applicant to either confirm that the information is not older than five years uh, in the version then, uh, that is submitted to access attention or to provide additional justification explaining the reason why, even if it's older information, it, its disclosure was to result in a potential harm to the applicant to a significant degree. Last but not least, EFSA is asking the applicant to confirm whether or not the information uh, claimed confidential falls under the definition of environmental information set out in Article 2 of the Arrows Regulation, as in this case, in, the, in this event, EFSA would have to apply um, the, uh, the proactive, uh, proactive disclosure requirements set out in that regulation. Next slide, please. Um, we have seen in the videos uh, shown by uh, Anastasia, our confidentiality request must be built in ESFC. Now, I would like to highlight here only that um, it is extremely important that the non-confidential version of the file includes um, correctly information that uh, is claimed confidential in a way that is irreversibly uh, blackened and, or blocked out. There are many uh, commercial tools that perform this, uh, this function and uh, ensure uh, the achievement of this, of this uh, requirement. And please note that if you don't do this, um, at, the, at the moment the application is considered valid, is deemed valid, uh, the uh, non-confidential version that you provide will be disseminated by EFSA as it stands. And this uh, will result, would result also in the disclosure of the information that you would like to keep confidential. So it's extremely important that you take extra care and you actually test the uh, attachments uh, in which you perform the reduction to verify that the information uh, cannot be, for instance, pasted, copied and pasted elsewhere, or that the box 
covering the information claim confidential uh, may not be moved. Then obviously, uh, as we anticipated, you have also to provide the verifiable justification we into that. Next slide, please. Um, the, the, same, uh, the same concepts apply also to the submission um, via the portalino. And here uh, I would also like to highlight that the confidential version uh, that is submitted both by, uh, via ESFC and the portalino must include um, in a clear must earmark, identify clearly the elements that are uh, claimed confidential. Again, this is to allow uh, not only to uh, perform a, an efficient uh, assessment of the confidentiality request, but also it is supposed to allow EFSA to highlight to the to its experts, to its staff, the elements of the documents that must be uh, kept confidential. So it's extremely important, again, that the confidential versions of the document include these earmarked uh, parts for what concerns information claimed confidential. Next slide, please. And again, uh, the same uh, concepts and uh, substantive requirements that we we saw already for the verifiable justification have also to be submitted uh, to the portalino to support the, um, the confidentiality request submitted for. Right, please. So if we can, let's say, identify some practical tips again, um, please make sure that the uh, confidential version of the files uh, identify and box or remark the information claim confidential. The public version or non-confidential version of these files use uh, uh, um, a reversible uh, reduction and do not allow the uh, copy pasting or the removal of the uh, of the boxes covering the uh, information claim confidential. Please, to the extent possible, submit one confidentiality request per document and per legal ground in order to facilitate the confidentiality assessment. And please ensure to comply uh, with all the substantive and procedural requirements we just saw um, and that are also set out in Articles uh, 9 and 10 of EFSA's practical arrangements concerning transparency and uh, confidentiality. I, and please, finally, do not uh, try not to duplicate or, or insert a duplicated entries because this would complicate the processing in the in the IT tools available to us. Next slide, please. As a last uh, um, as a last uh, um, concept and and points that I would like uh, to. To, to, to show you, um, this, slide, uh, this slide depicts the uh, confidentiality assessment process once a confidentiality request is submitted to EFSA's attention. Once this is done and the application is deemed valid or admissible, then EFSA starts, commences the uh, confidentiality assessment process and uh, shares with the applicant a draft decision on confidentiality uh, for, uh, for about which the applicant has uh, two weeks, uh, two weeks in choice of two weeks timeline for the submission of comments or for the withdrawal of the application dossier. Unless the application is withdrawn, the uh, F7 uh, takes into account the comments received from the applicant, uh, complements or finalizes the confidentiality decision and notifies the confidentiality decision to the applicant again via ESFC or in case this is unavailable uh, by using uh, email, uh, traditional email. Uh, um, for what concerns um, instead the in case uh, the applicant is, uh, let's say, not satisfied by the outcome of the confidentiality request, once the uh, notification is performed, the applicant has the possibility of submitting a confirmatory application on the confidentiality decision by sending uh, an email to the function mailbox in, in case the SFC is, uh, is, is not available or by submitting the confirmatory application uh, by the ESFC platform directly. Um, and this will result in the uh, review of the uh, initial decision to be performed by staff who was not involved in the first uh, confidentiality decision making iteration. If this is not done or uh, the uh, decision on the confirmatory application confirms the initial decision, 
EFSA then proceeds with the implementation of its confidentiality decisions by sanitizing, or that is uh, better, most likely, by uh, unblackening um, uh, certain the elements on which uh, the confidentiality requests submitted by the applicants were rejected. In any event, um, and the last uh, as a last uh, stand and uh, iteration possible in this process, in case EFSA uh, identifies uh, at, uh, at the risk assessment phase foreseeable effects on human health, animal health or the environment, and this is reported in the scientific opinion, and these uh, effects relate to items that were granted confidential status under uh, the confidentiality decision making process uh, uh, we described uh, uh, in this slide. Uh, EFSA is required to reopen the uh, already closed um, confidentiality decision making process and uh, let's say waive the confidential status regarding these elements. These elements regarding foreseeable effects on human health, animal health, or the environment, because it is assumed by the legislator that the public uh, has the right to know also these details. Now, this will, however, not happen without the involvement of the applicant, because even in this event, the confidentiality decision making process will restart for what concerns these particular elements, and therefore the applicants will be consulted again on the draft decision, will receive the final notified decision, and will again have the possibility of submitting a confirmatory application on the initial decision uh, in case obviously it affects in a negative manner its legal legal situation. Last but not least, um, please note that uh, legal uh, judicial review is available only against the uh, confirmatory decision, that is the decision on the confirmatory application. It is not available uh, against the initial decision taken by EFSA. With this, I've concluded uh, the part on confidentiality and I pass the floor back to Benedicte. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Simone. You, Simone. So, so continuing with the public consultation, uh, so the transparency regulation also brought an increase in public consultations on by EFSA. So in the next slide, please, you can see the different types of public consultations. So EFSA has uh, five different types of public consultation. However, for the applications on GMO, the public consultation on the list of intended studies in the context of a renewal application, as well as the newly introduced public consultation on the non-confidential version of the dossier after validation are the relevant ones. So as and um, just to flag that as the public consultation happens after the validation of the application, it could be considered already formally part of the risk assessment. So moving to the next slide, please to zoom in onto into these two types of public consultation. So the first one is the public consultation on the list of intended studies for an application for renewal. So uh, there is a submission uh, the, of the list of intended studies for renewal, followed by an administrative check by EFSA. Then uh, the public consultation is launched for a period of three weeks. Um, following the closure of the public consultation, as I mentioned before, is uh, the disclosure immediately of the third party comments received on the open EFSA, the dissemination portal, and then the publication of the consultation outcomes, so the re including the renewal pre-submission advice, is published as an annex to the pre-submission advice uh, summary. Uh, so the aim of such a public consultation, the list of intended studies for application renewal is to inform the elaboration of the renewal pre-submission advice uh, to the applicant. Um, so this for the, the first type of public consultation applicable for the GMO applications, then moving uh, to the next one is indeed uh, the public consultation on the non-confidential version of the dossier after the validation. Um, so again, here um, the business operator submits an application, requests confidentiality. Following the confidentiality assessment, there is um, the publication of the non-confidential version of the dossier, including the confidentiality decision. I mean, in, uh, sanitized in line with the confidentiality decision. Uh, the launch of the public consultation, again, three calendar weeks, um, followed by the publication of the third party comments immediately uh, at the closure of the public consultation on the open EFSA, and then um, the publication of the consultation outcome. So EFSA will be considering the comments uh, and this will be published together with the final scientific output as an annex. Uh, 
So the aim here of the public consultation is to collect new or additional evidence, data or information uh, that were not part of the dossier submitted by the applicant and to consider this in the risk assessment. So moving to the next slide, please. So here you can see some screenshots of the Connect EFSA uh, portal where you can see the different, uh, so you can find the public consultation um, and you can see the list of the plant, the open and the closed consultation. Uh, so you can find the Connect EFSA from the EFSA website. So moving to the next slide. Uh, so the comments collected during a public consultation are made public immediately after the closure of the consultation on the open EFSA. Here you can find the screenshots on where to find the public consultation comments. And um, so they are published under calendar and closed consultation. So following the, this pathway, you can find back the comments that were published uh, for already closed public consultation on uh, dossiers. So moving to the next slide, please. Um, so we move now to the very last phase of uh, the application life, life cycle. So the risk assessment. Um, there you see in orange uh, what is new. So basically um, the assessment of the confidentiality request on the newly submitted additional data following an additional information request. So following a clock stop. Um, so this is new. All the rest uh, of the process is the same. So no changes here. So moving to the next slide, what is the last one is indeed the output publication and the dissemination phase. Again here uh, there is a notification on the adopted output as before, editorial checks, uh, pre-notification of the scientific output, so nothing changes here compared to pre-transparency. The only thing is indeed what is in orange that besides the scientific output, all the supporting evidences will also be made publicly available on the Open EFSA. Um, so that brings me to the end of the, the process and also of the presentation. So I now give the floor to Goran, uh, who will moderate uh, the, the live Q&A session. Goran, please. Thank you, Benedict. And uh, just, uh, OK, we had uh, this one slide on the information, useful information, but uh, we can then, uh, yes, here we will also provide uh, a slide with the useful information with an overview of legal documents, guidelines and training materials that you could then uh, use. And uh, uh, going then into the question and answer part of this webinar, we have uh, indeed uh, received many questions and colleagues uh, did uh, uh, a lot of uh, work to answer to the questions. So we have received uh, uh, 20 different questions here uh, just to see uh, if we can respond to any uh, of those uh, in orally. I could uh, uh, invite my colleague Stefano Cape to take the question for the oral intervention. Uh, okay. Yes. Stefano, thank you. Thank you, Goran. Can you see me? Yes, indeed. I can see you. Yes. I suppose you are referring to the questions on the integration with uh, uh, be between ES, uh, ES, uh, FC and EFSA Connect, correct? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Yes, OK. Um, yes, um, here we uh, can reply that uh, uh, currently we have visibility on the enhancement to the system that are already planned uh, currently until uh, um, basically September this year. Uh, in this, uh, uh, let's say, phase, uh, we had to give priority to, let's say, other uh, more urgent uh, uh, um, features. And for this reason, this, uh, um, this feature is not yet uh, scheduled in this uh, part. Um, the, um, the feature is, um, we, we are aware of the need of this feature 
and we will take it into account uh, in uh, the next uh, uh, phases of the improvement of the tool in the future. But currently we cannot provide you yet an expected timeline for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stefano. We are now looking into uh, some uh, remaining questions. As I mentioned, we have uh, provided written answers uh, to most of the questions. And now uh, just to look if we have any remaining that we could uh, take also orally. So uh, I would invite uh, my colleague Anastasia to take the question related to the very submission and uh, saving option and submission of, of the application. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you. Thank you, Goran. Um, yes, we have received the question on the saving of uh, the application. Of course, yes, this is uh, this is possible. It is possible to save um, during the process the application and uh, continue at a later uh, stage. It is not mandatory to submit everything in one uh, go. Um, uh, as I showed earlier in this dashboard, you are able to have also the questions that are uh, in draft, so you can always go back uh, there, uh, make changes uh, and even delete uh, at any stage. So the application does not need to be submitted immediately, so you can keep it there as a draft as long as you wish and uh, delete it also at um, any moment if um, um, if the application is not required or if you are just um, uh, testing how the system works. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anastasia. And uh, with this, uh, we would move to the closure of this webinar today. Uh, I would uh, remind uh, also if uh, any of the questions would remain unanswered, you please proceed with submitting those via our regu regular channel for Ask EFSA question, where we will then uh, reply uh, to your questions. Uh, here, just before closing the webinar, I would like to provide you uh, some uh, practical and logistical information. If we can move to the slide related to the LinkedIn group, uh, please. OK, thank you so much. Uh, we would like to remind you of the existing uh, LinkedIn group. Uh, this is a group uh, that was uh, created to provide support to applicants. And um, if you are a current or potential food and feed regulated product, applicant. This group is a uh, really right place uh, for you. At the moment, uh, we have uh, around 450 members and the group is growing bigger. This uh, gives us indication that the information we are posting is useful for our applicants. Uh, you can find here updates uh, with the relevant information and material to support applicants. Uh, also updates on the progress with the IT tools and platforms, as well as uh, alerts on the new training materials and upcoming events. Uh, this also uh, provides a space for interaction with peers on common issues and to share experience. If we move to the next slide, please. Yes. Here before closing, I would uh, just remind uh, on the satisfaction survey that um, uh, we will then shortly uh, send be sending to you. Um, we are also uh, recording this webinar and we will post it on the web uh, page in coming days. Uh, for what concerns the feedback, uh, uh, you are uh, really encouraged and welcome to submit your um, feedback uh, to our satisfaction survey. Uh, this would take you a few minutes uh, and uh, it will provide us with valuable input for uh, future events. You can also indicate uh, possible topics that you would like to see addressed in future events. 
With this, uh, I would uh, like to thank uh, you all for attending. Thanks uh, to our colleagues from EFSA for presenting and for uh, contributing to answering the questions. And thanks uh, to all the participants for joining us today. On behalf of EFSA team, uh, I would like uh, to thank you again for your cooperation and engagement. Thanks for your attention and uh, I wish you a nice day.